lecture sixteen part one of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture sixteen on humility as the counterpart of charity part one god is charity and he who abideth in charity abideth in god and god in him one john chapter four verse sixteen it is to be regretted that the necessity of language compels us to apply one and the same term to things so remote from each other and so contradictory of each other as charity and cupidity for we have to explain both by the word love and to say that charity is the love of god and cupidity the love of self and of all that feeds the love of self when we compare these two kinds of love we find nothing in common between them except that unhappily the love of concupiscence solicits the very same will with its affections as the love of charity but charity is the cause of all spiritual life and cupidity the cause of all spiritual corruption and death let us ascend in mind through the grace of god to the divine fountain of all charity god is charity charity is the life and perfection of his being what an infinitude of life and love is expressed in these three little words god is charity as the shell on the sandy shore cannot contain the ocean that rolls round the world as the laboring breast of man cannot contain the pure and boundless ether that fills the heavens as the body of man could not pass into the intense conflagration of the sun without instant destruction neither can the soul of man embrace comprehend or enter into the infinite charity of god yet some drops of the ocean are in that shell some little modified breath of that ether is in the breast of man and some tempered rays of the warmth of that sun are in our earthly frame some created rays from his uncreated charity has god also deigned to impart to the soul of the humble christian which are full of divine life and love and in virtue of that sublime gift the moment the words are sounded in his ears he knows and feels to his inmost core that god is charity the ardent apostle of the gentiles was consumed with charity yet with a special reference to this perfecting gift he says we know in part and we prophesy in part but when that which is perfect is come that which is in part shall be done away we see now through a glass in a dark manner but then face to face now i know in part but then shall i know even as i am known and now there remain faith hope and charity these three but the greater of these is charity one corinthians chapter thirteen verses nine through thirteen from the part which he saw and felt the apostle prophesied the whole and he showed the exceeding goodness of god to us sinful mortals when he declared god commendeth his charity towards us romans chapter five verse eight the innocent saint john drew large draughts of charity from the breast of the son of god and was filled to overflowing with divine love yet he only knew and felt in part but prophesied the whole when he said that god is charity god is the essential uncreated charity there is no charity besides except the charity imparted from his own eternal charity for charity can never take its first beginning from the creature all this is embraced in the words of st john god is charity and he who abideth in charity abideth in god and god in him the supreme beauty of god is the splendor of his supreme goodness and his supreme truth is the effulgence of that infinite goodness and beauty and the supreme justice 
is the order of that goodness and this infinite goodness beauty and justice have infinite sweetness of all the attributes of god charity is the most noble embracing all uniting all in a certain way transcending all because charity is the life of god the mode of his action the perfection of his essence for god is infinite love infinitely loving and infinitely beloved the reason of his essential love is his essential goodness beauty and sweetness whose nature it is to be infinitely communicated and diffused through his infinite action eternally circling in the holy trinity for the father is infinite love and contemplating the character of his substance in his son he infinitely loves the son and the son loves the father equally and the infinite love of the father and son eternally produces the holy spirit of love the divine term of love the divine person of love the consummation of the holy trinity in love the active principle of all charity as the holy spirit is the personal consummation of the charity which god is through the action of the same holy spirit the gift of charity is communicated to us for all charity is of god as all truth is of god truth comes to us from his eternal word and charity from his holy spirit for as there can be no charity whose principle is not in god there can be none in any created spirit or soul which is not given by god hence charity is the most excellent of all things and is communicative of its excellence and by its excellence it unites the created spirit with god there is no other reason for the existence of this world than the charity of god and the communication of his charity the world was made for man man for the soul the soul for charity and charity unites the soul with god from charity god created the world and by charity he perfects the end for which the world was made for that end is the happiness of souls possessed of charity hence st john tells us that charity is of god and every one that loveth is born of god and knoweth god one john chapter four verse seven rightly observes st bernard it is said that charity is god and the gift of god wherefore charity gives charity the substantial charity gives the accidental charity not that god communicates to us his own uncreated charity which is his nature and would be unsuited to our condition of probation for our god is a consuming fire deuteronomy chapter four verse twenty four and he would either consume us by its infinite power or would absorb and enrapture us into his ecstatic vision and therefore he said to moses man shall not see me and live exodus chapter thirty three verse twenty but from his eternal charity through the action of his holy spirit god communicates to us the gift of created charity as a ray is given from the sun or to use saint augustine's expression as light produces the light that enlightens us or as we are warmed by the heat from a fire though the fire itself would consume us from this we must understand that charity can come from no power of our nature from nothing of our own but it is the divinest grace of god and the noblest habit of virtue in the soul and is infused by the holy spirit as saint paul says the love of god is spread abroad in our hearts through the holy spirit dwelling within us romans chapter five verse five and by this dwelling in charity through charity dwelling in us we live and move towards god and are united with god and as saint peter says we are made partakers of the divine nature 2 peter chapter 1 verse 4 
that is by a created participation on this divine subject saint augustine has written these golden words god is love and they that are faithful in love shall rest in him wisdom chapter three verse nine when we are withdrawn from the noise of the creature and collected to the inward joy of silence behold god is love why do we go running up to the high things of heaven and down to the low things of earth in search of him who is with us whenever we choose to be with him let no one say i know not what to love let him love his brother and he will love that very love for he will know the love with which he loves better than the brother whom he loves he will know that love the best because it is in his own interior and therefore more certain embrace the god who is love and embrace him with love that is the love which unites all the good angels and all the servants of god in one bond of sanctity and that unites us with them and them with us and subjects and unites the whole to god the sounder we are from the absence of the tumour of pride the fuller we are of love and of what are we full when full of love but full of god for i look upon charity and as far as i can see i see it with my mind and believe the scripture where it says that god is charity and he that abideth in charity abideth in god we must first then understand that charity is from god because god is charity and that charity can only be received from him that we may be made like to him and may have life from him and be united with him in the bond of his charity there is a kind of life in the soul without charity but it is not the life for which the soul was made not true life but initiatory and mere infantile life which is life in pain and sorrow from want of our true life as saint irenaeus says the animal body itself is not the soul but it partakes of the soul so long as god wills it and so the soul herself is not life but she partakes of a life given to her by god secondly charity is from god because he first loved us and created us to be the subjects and partakers of his charity so that as saint paul says without charity we are nothing for we are without the gift and the good for which we are created and which begins our union with god when therefore that gift was lost to man through pride and sin god in his infinite condescension put forth that charity anew in a wonderful and surpassing way which saint john dwells upon in these words by this hath the charity of god appeared towards us because god has sent his only begotten son into the world that we may live by him in this is charity not as though we had loved god but because he hath first loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins one john chapter four verses nine and ten the sublime proof that the incarnation ordained for the destruction of pride and the restoration of charity to man was the work of eternal charity is shown in its being the work of the holy spirit thirdly charity is from god because he has given us the great law of charity as the fulfilment of all his laws and the perfection of justice he gives the law of life and the life by which the law is fulfilled fourthly in the very law of love we have the guarantee that to humble souls for they alone are capable the grace of charity will never be wanting for the god who is charity does not mock his children but when he commands them to love him with their whole heart and soul and strength and mind he gives them the charity by which they may love him for as mortal love is from nature and carnal love from carnal sense and worldly love is from the world 
the love of god must be from god and this divine gift is always ready to enter the soul whenever humility has expelled the destructive enemy of all charity wherefore to sum up this glorious truth in the words of eternal charity he says to the soul through the prophet jeremias i have loved thee with an everlasting love therefore have i drawn thee having compassion on thee jeremias chapter thirty one verse three but when we speak or think of divine love we must dismiss from our mind and discard from our feelings every notion and sense of that human love which has not been embraced and purified by being brought within the sphere of charity to quote the luminous book on the divine names when that love which beseemeth god is commended and not by us only but by the holy scriptures men who have no insight into that conformity with god which the divine name of charity signifies will fly to that sensual and distracting love with which they are familiar and which is not true love but an image or rather a lapse from true love for the multitude cannot form a right notion of the preeminence of the one divine love but the contemplators of god use the word love in the sense of the divine language and according to the force it has with those who rightly understand divine things according to this sense love is a power that unifies collects and excellently tempers together what pre-exists in the good and beautiful through the good and beautiful and emanates from the good and beautiful for the sake of the good and beautiful and contains equals through mutual connection after this description of the love of the adorable trinity the author describes the communication of charity to the creature as moving in the providence of inferior things and through a certain conversion uniting what is inferior to what is superior after this exposition of the nature of divine charity the author enlarges upon its action moreover he says the divine love is ecstatic not suffering him who loves to be his own but his whom he loves this is shown when god descends through his providence from his superiority to inferior existences and by a divine conversion unites them with his superiority thus was saint paul taken hold of by the divine love and partaking of its ecstatic virtue he was able to say i live now not i but christ liveth in me he was a true lover he went out of himself to god he lived his own life no longer but the life of him whom he so vehemently loved to this it should be added that the divine author of all things in the good and beautiful love of all and from the supreme excellence of his loving goodness descends through his providence of all and is imbued as it were with love and is delighted with it and whereas he is above all and exempt from all he yet descends in power to all although in exceeding himself he departs not from himself and because of his great and benignant love of all he is called the zealous god for he awakens the zeal of his creatures to desire to love him and puts forth his zeal to make them zealous who desire the good things that he provides for them finally love and what deserves love is the truly good and beautiful it pre-exists in the good and beautiful and is made and exists for the good and the beautiful he who abideth in charity abideth in god and god in him he abideth in god because god is charity and all charity partakes of his charity hence st paul says to the christian endowed with charity know you not that you are the temple of god and the spirit of god dwelleth in you one corinthians chapter three verse sixteen for charity is with god and with us the uncreated charity abides with the created charity that is in the living soul 
so that in a certain mysterious way there is a communion with god in the loving soul and we are made partakers of the divine nature he therefore who loves abides in god as an object known and loved and is endowed with eternal life from god and god abides in him as the divine object whom he knows and whom he loves with supernatural affection for his own divine sake for charity unites god and the soul in a mutual union transforming the one who loves into the one beloved and the one beloved into the one who loves according to the degree of love through the unifying spirit of the divine gift this brings us to the definition of the virtue of charity which st thomas defines to be a certain noble friendship between god and man a virtue that is not only one special and created but is of all virtues the most excellent we may enlarge upon this definition in the words of albert the great that soul has true and perfect charity to god who moves and advances with all her powers in the love of god because of the greatness goodness sanctity perfection and blessedness that belong to him as the supreme good as god does not infuse his divine gifts into our soul for his own sake but for ours and with the soul desire that we should partake of his beatitude we also ought to love god chiefly for his sake although not ignorant of or indifferent to the good with which he will reward us because that good is himself charity is the affectionate recognition of all the good that god is and of all the good that he is to us it is also the return to him for his immense and eternal love of us our lord has given us the genuine proof by which we may know whether we do love god or not he that hath my commandments and keepeth them he it is that loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved by my father and i will love him and will manifest myself to him st john chapter fourteen verse twenty one go into yourselves brethren says st gregory seek within you whether you truly love god believe nothing of your love but what you can prove by works love asks for the tongue the mind the life the love of god is never idle it works great things if it refuses to work it is not love there are two other signs of the true love of god if we rejoice in all the good that is done for the love of god by whomsoever wheresoever and whensoever done and if we grieve for all that is done displeasing to god by whomsoever wheresoever or whensoever done for it is the property of charity to love all that god loves and to be displeased at all that displeases god end of lecture sixteen part one lecture sixteen part two of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture sixteen on humility as the counterpart of charity part two true charity to our neighbor is to love him whether friend or foe as we love ourself in god unto god and for god's sake for the charitable love of our neighbor is embraced in the love of god proceeds from the love of god and ends in the love of god the true test of this charity which our lord has given us is the love of those who are inimical to us of which he gives us a great example in his conduct to the traitor judas for knowing that he would betray him he still kept him in his company and gave him his body and blood and at the moment of betrayal he called him friend and allowed the treacherous kiss nothing makes us more like to god 
than to forgive those who offend and injure us and we may certainly obtain more grace and glory from god through persecution than through kindness if we know how to use it rightly thus the persecutors were more profitable to the eternal glory of the martyrs than their friends but we ought to love our neighbours as ourselves by desiring them all the good and the absence of all the evil that we desire ourselves and by doing for them whatever service we can especially in their needs charity is the rectitude of the soul correcting her aberrations bringing up to straightness what has been bent and deformed in her inclinations and lifting the affections upwards towards the summit of good charity is the beauty and dignity of the soul this beauty comes to her in the gift of love from the infinite beauty of god and she receives a reflection of beauty from all the good that she loves in charity charity is the living form of the virtues animating them with life and vigour and directing them to their final end st paul expresses all the value of charity when he calls it the bond of perfection colossians chapter three verse fourteen for it unites the soul with god and through her union with god unites her also with the angels and saints and by sympathy with all the good that god has anywhere imparted for charity is all embracing of good as it proceeds from that divine charity which either is all good or is productive of all good and is therefore inclined to all good being rooted and founded in charity says st paul you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know also the charity of god which surpasseth all knowledge that you may be filled unto all the fullness of god ephesians chapter three verses seventeen through nineteen charity not only unites the parts of the spiritual structure as st anthony of padua observes but gives to the powers and to the virtues which they exercise their proper pliant and suitable conditions and their free and responsive dispositions for example the mind to loving faith the heart to loving obedience the eyes to modesty and the body to purity glass is a fragile thing but when fused in the fire it is ductile to new forms and tenacious of the form received our sensual nature is as fragile as glass but is tractable and reformable under the fire of charity charity is the way to man as well as to god it conciliates all intelligences and though there may be much excitement in what the world calls pleasure there is no solid joy of life or peace of heart except in charity but though charity is one and all who are in charity are united in one and the same charity there are many degrees of its communication and growth in individual souls which is owing to their several conditions when born in the soul it is incipient when nourished in the soul it advances further within when rooted and founded in the depth of the soul it is perfect when god is desired above all things whatsoever it is most perfect as charity and justice are one st augustine measures the advancement of charity by the advancement of justice charity begun he says is justice begun charity advanced is justice advanced great charity is great justice and perfect charity is perfect justice st bonaventure the seraphic doctor of charity has given us the signs by which to know the presence of perfect charity it is perfect he says when it has become a great habit direct in its interior motive solicitous in its exterior works firmly consolidated in its root discreet in its fervour and consoling in its sweetness 
what then are the relations of humility with charity this is a most important question humility disposes the soul and prepares the way for charity and greater humility prepares and disposes the soul for greater charity for the goodness of the divine charity is not restrained but is always ready to be communicated more generously where the soul is able to receive its abundance and humility makes her able and the charity received increases humility for humility is the counterpart of charity both these points we must now explain we must first repeat that maxim of eternal truth which is the foundation of the whole economy of grace and which is therefore repeated in so many forms in the sacred scriptures that god resists the proud but gives his grace to the humble and we may add as a necessary consequence that he gives his greatest graces to the most humble for pride falsifies the man but humility makes him truthful pride is the radical injustice of the soul but humility strives to be just to god to self and to all creatures pride thinks of self above all things humility looks to god above all things pride presumes upon one's own self-sufficiency humility sees and feels one's utter inefficiency pride feels no want of the divine help humility feels the want of god in everything pride has no desire beyond self-satisfaction humility can never rest contented without the charity of god pride is the revolt of the soul from god and is always aiming at independence humility is subject to god and looks on the isolation of independence with horror as on a desert of solitude pride closes the heart against god humility opens the heart to god wherefore humility is the proper disposition and the due preparation for receiving the charity of god who gives his grace to the humble it seems almost irreverent to put the question but how can the divine generosity dwell with ungodly selfishness how can god enter with his holiest gift into a soul whose pride resists him how can he unite with a soul that prefers herself to him how can he spread abroad his love in a heart already filled through all its veins and passages with the love of self how can he infuse the most precious gift of eternal life into a soul that prefers her own life and that will only abuse the gift of gifts in the interests of pride god must recall his gift as soon as given for there is no society between charity and pride between the holy and the profane between christ and belial if god is charity says saint basil the devil must be pride and as he who abideth in charity abideth in god he who abideth in pride must abide in the devil god cannot abide with pride but only with humility for the lord is high and looketh on the low and the high he knoweth afar off psalm 136 verse 6 even when the deadly pride of mortal sin has been vanquished by the grace of humility and penance and charity is restored the remains of pride will lurk in certain faculties of the soul and impede the perfection of charity from the want of perfect humility many of the fathers and saints have dwelt upon the essential and intimate relations that prevail between these consummate virtues the relations between which have been repeatedly expressed by st augustine in terms like these if you dig deep within you the foundations of humility you will come to the summit of charity by which the saint intimates that although humility is founded in divine grace it is the fruit of great labor whilst charity is given to the humble without labor 
in the celebrated letter to the virgin demetriades already quoted the author says humility and charity are in no wise separate from each other such is their connection that whoever is constructed in the one is possessed of the other for as humility is a part of charity charity is a part of humility st cesarius of arles says true humility never was never is and never can be without charity fire cannot be without heat and brightness nor charity without humility st valerian says humility is the intimate association of charity st peter of cluny writes to st bernard where charity is absent humility is absent and where humility is absent charity is absent Blosius says no one grows or advances in charity who does not grow in humility thomas a kempis writes the way to charity is through humility for to indulge in self-elation is to go far from charity st teresa writes i can neither understand nor conceive how humility exists or can exist without love or love without humility we might quote on indefinitely but these passages from such great authorities will suffice to impress this important truth on the mind all sincere love even in the natural order has in it a self-forgettingness a devotedness and a submission of inclination to the person beloved a kind of natural humility that makes it an image of the union of humility with charity to leave lovers out though none have or profess to have more of this kind of humility than those who sue in courtship this union of self-renunciation with affection is realized in friendship in a happy marriage and in a mother's devotedness to her children the true friend has no pride with his friend his heart is open to him he gives up his selfishness for him he is devoted to him he yields many inclinations to him and when occasion calls for it he is ready to make sacrifices on his account a happily married pair are not only devoted to each other and live in each other but the very foundation of their happiness is in the surrender that each makes to the other of their selfish inclinations all which becomes easy through their mutual affection consider the blended humility and love of a mother towards her children she is all self-forgetfulness devotedness and service she descends into all their little ways and lives in them more than in herself becoming almost a child with them whilst retaining her maternal authority and this humility of love springs from the united sense of duty and affection these examples may help to explain how there can be no true love of any kind without a proportionate self-renunciation and humility for the one element is the essential counterpart of the other for humility is the sacrificial element in all sincere love for as love is the transfer of our affection from oneself to another it includes a surrender of self-love and this surrender is humility but when we give up our love from ourselves to god this giving up of our love of self to god is humility and the love that we give to god is charity hence st john chrysostom calls humility maximum sacrificium the greatest of all sacrifices because it is the sacrifice of self consider the sacrifice of our lord jesus christ the model of all sacrifice perfect humility was its foundation and perfect charity its end he gave his whole nature to the father and the father gave him all charity and power for the saving of mankind we have drawn more than one illustration of the spiritual from the material world and we may here introduce another 
electricity is one of the great and secret elements of material nature which has perhaps a nearer analogy with spiritual power than any other although the knowledge of its function in the universe is as yet but little understood this however appears to be the fundamental law of its action that the positive electric force cannot move without the negative there must be a vacuity or a capacity before this mysterious power can act or move so it is with charity god is always ready to impart to souls the fire of divine love but there must be a negative a vacuity of self a capacity to receive its action humility and charity are the negative and positive poles of sanctity and the positive pole of charity will only act where there is the negative pole of humility to explain this in another way we cannot approach one object or place without leaving another this law arises from our limitation here again is the negative and the positive we cannot approach to god without leaving ourselves for it is impossible in the nature of things to concentrate our affections on ourselves and yet open and expand them towards god the leaving ourselves is humility the approaching to god is charity in one and the selfsame act the will or love of the soul abandons the less for the greater self for god this fundamental law of human sanctity is expressed in the words of the psalm already repeatedly quoted empty yourself and see that i am god psalm forty five verse eleven or as in the hebrew text cease and see that i am god that is to say cease from yourself vacate yourself or as st augustine puts it pour out yourself that you may be filled with god there is but one impediment to this but one adversary of the divine grace and that is the unjust and extravagant love of oneself through this cupidity not love for love is not given to self but to another we form an idol within our heart of which we make a god and serve as a god and secretly compare it with god and without any act of judgment prefer it to god this false god is a fiction blown together from many base materials which in the whole amount to nothing better than a lying pretension to an excellence we do not possess and to an assertion of merit that in no wise belongs to us cease from all this says the almighty empty yourself of this and you will see and know that i am god as humility is the just thought of what we are and the right action of our will towards god from the knowledge of what he is to us we come to see our poverty in the light of his excellence and then descending from our conceits and renouncing our fictitious independence we honestly endeavor to be the subjects of god and he gives us his charity and friendship and we partake in his life and this infused fire of life passes into our will and from the will into all the powers and we live in god but this new life gives us a new sense the sense of god and by this sense we know that without this life from god we are poor weak blind and senseless and the nearer we bring our hearts to god the more sensible we become that life is from god and not from us thus charity infuses a new grace of deeper humility which as we labor to make fruitful obtains for us yet greater charity not that one charity is added to another for there is but one charity but that charity penetrates more deeply into the soul and is more expanded in proportion as the soul is more vacated of self-love and more subject to the divine gift and more active in cooperation 
thus the charity that inspires greater humility and the greater humility that opens the way to still greater charity augments the virtuous action of the soul in two directions in greater contempt of self and in greater admiration of god in more complete abandonment of self and in stronger adhesion to god in greater hatred of self and in greater love of god who has truly loved god and has never felt those moments of intense peace that arise from forgetfulness of self in god such moments so filled with life are a foretaste of the eternal peace compare those moments with the hours of trouble in the one case self is almost forgotten in god and time and place seem almost to have receded from us in the other it is our troubled self that is before us and our wounded self-love is the cause of all our distress god holds but the second place in our feelings time hangs heavily on us and place seems to reflect our pain there is no cure for this state of things but the humility that gives us self-renunciation and the charity that gives us wisdom end of lecture sixteen part two lecture sixteen part three of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 16 on Humility as the Counterpart of Charity, Part 3. Let us now come to rule. The whole secret of self management is in two simple principles the motive of the will and the action of the will, for the will is the seed of charity the first thing is to keep the will to the right motive to the simplest the purest the highest the best this can be nothing but the love of god which contains all other good motives as pure light contains all colors keep to this motive foster this motive be humble for this motive cherish it by thinking of it with affection impulse is not motive it is the base intrusion of cupidity look to your motive and impulse will drop motive is seen in the light of god when the will deviates to lower motives quietly bring it back if a selfish motive gets mixed with a pure motive you will know it by its causing trouble and disquiet clear it away by concentrating the heart on the true motive and peace will return for the best way to clear off the mixture of inferior motive is to transcend it to rise above it by redoubling the devotion of the will to the will and love of god and nothing holds the will to its divine motive so effectually as the frequent aspiration of that motive within the soul which in time becomes the easiest and sweetest of all exercises the second principle is the exercise of the will upon which all virtue depends it is a great thing to do our best and with our best judgment on all occasions this makes the will habitually vigorous and wise but it requires the keeping up the will above the inferior nature neither attending to its languors nor listening to its excuses and complaints do this and your inferior nature will learn submission and you will get into the habit of freedom a wise man of the world watches over his external conduct the wise man of god watches over the interior conduct of his will right motive will keep the will right and when that motive is charity the will does wonders those who first give themselves with ardour to the service of god have generally what saint benedict calls the fervour of novices god gives them an ardour and an unction to win them to his love and service but as they are far as yet from being purified in their affections this works in them in a mixed way for the providence of grace consults their weakness 
and draws them partly by the cords of charity and partly by the cords of adam they are still much in themselves and in their own sensibilities and this new wine of charity brings them a new and delightful experience that not only inebriates the spirit but flows into the imagination and takes hold of the natural sensibilities the consequence is that there is much sense of self as well as of god and enjoyment of self as well as of god and whoever is experienced in the ways of souls will see that like the movement of a pendulum there is a constant vibration of the affections of the will between self and god which is betrayed not only in much self-ignorance but in a diversity of failures and indiscretions as a general fact this first fervour is less a love of god in god than a love of god in self but after a certain period this fervour with its ferment of self-love comes to an end and the period is ordained for probation purification and self-knowledge this is a time of labour a time also for gaining true humility that the soul may be prepared for a purer gift of charity to this period we may apply the words of moses to the israelites the lord your god trieth you that it may appear whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul or not deuteronomy chapter thirteen verse three the former sweet attractive grace is changed to a grace of support divested of sensibility and the light of justice is left in the soul without the light of consolation then that soul finds out her weakness and her self-love and the failings that spring from them all of which in her fervour she never dreamed yet that weakness was there and that self-love even during the inebriation of fervour though the soul was little conscious of their presence imagining great things above her strength but now that soul finds out how much she is still inclined to herself though but recently she seemed to soar on wings and how much there is in her to purify and set in order the desire of god was enkindled in her fervour and that desire remains when the fervour is gone but now god shows her how much it will cost to gain perfect humility and detachment that she may adhere to god with the whole heart and will this is the critical time in the spiritual life requiring great fortitude and perseverance in humble ways the one point of difficulty is this the fear of leaving oneself the way to which has yet to be learnt for in that first fervour so dear to memory there was as we have said a considerable mixture of natural sensibility and the soul still seeks in herself what can only be found in god the will still clings on one side to self with the sort of dread that to lose one's sense of self is to lose everything and is unable as yet to distinguish a certain pious sense of self so to speak from the sense of god but it is a long way from self to god and those who cling to their own house will never make the journey the venture must be made with faith and made with sacrifice this is the reason why the old experienced fathers of the desert attach so much importance to the giving up one's will with reverence to the wise it trains the soul to quit her self-love and to abandon self for god our lord has told us the solemn truth he that shall save his life shall lose it and he that shall lose his life for me shall save it st luke chapter nine verse twenty four our true life is not in ourselves but in god we must lose to gain we must detach the will from oneself to attach it to god as long as the heart is divided between self and god there will be nothing but an unpeaceful swinging of the will backwards and forwards between god and self 
so that no great advancement is gained no solid rest found no decided peace obtained but the heart detached from self feels the eternal life rests in it with peace and adheres with constancy to god after all that laborious humility an infused humility inspires contempt and dread of the fascinating love of self and gratitude is given to god and nothing to self the pure love of god indifferent to all changes of mood in oneself is not only charity but humility and when a soul reaches this charity of humility and humility of charity she will understand these words of st francis of sales all that is not god of god in god for god or according to god should appear to us as nothing and even cause in us a sense of horror but there is a more subtle and profound combination of humility with charity in those who are advancing in the perfection of the love of god a combination that demonstrates their wonderful strength as the soul approaches near to god for besides the mortification of the passions there is a more secret and difficult abnegation of self-love and self-will which should be continuous because it is not the beginning but the progress and completion of that humility and charity which perfect the soul this abnegation proceeds from the knowledge and sense of the might majesty charity and will of god it submits the inmost soul to god and makes her love her own abjection and contempt desiring nothing more and caring for nothing so much as to break down her own will and inclinations so as if possible to destroy the roots of evil and the opposition to god within her this has been so well explained from the experience and teaching of the saints and the devoutly learned by father rossignoli that we shall chiefly follow his exposition it is certain that we belong to god and not to ourselves that he has all rights over us and that we have no rights against his will if our will is in our own power it is so given us that we may freely subject it to the law of the supreme wisdom and goodness and may surrender it wholly to him that he may dispose of us as he sees best for our final good and to the glory of his grace we may ask then is it better that god should guide our will to him by consolations or by afflictions and the fathers and saints reply it is better that god should draw us to him through things against our will than through things that allure and soothe the will for these are the most holy and such as we should not seek for our own sake but only for the sake of god such are the external trials of poverty contempt ignominy and things of that kind such are the internal and greater trials of desolation severe temptations distress of heart mental darkness anxiety of mind and things of this kind which make life bitter for to be conversant and to be exercised in them for the quieting of our will is far better for us than the contrary good so long as with our will we adhere to god let not the proficient then prepare for ease and pleasure but rather for internal afflictions let him not look for peace in himself but for peace in the will of god and he may look securely for that peace however much tossed upon the floods of perturbation the reason for this assertion is that the chief ground of merit before god is the abnegation of self-esteem and self-love for the exercise of which adversity is more helpful than prosperity whether that adversity be external and from the world or internal and from the soul for the repressing of self-esteem the knowledge of our vileness is needful and although this knowledge comes from god's illuminating the mind and is so given to the blessed yet it is best suited to us who are travelling through this world 
when it is born of experience as god has not the design of destroying but of perfecting our nature he would have us to know our vileness from experience and to make good use of this experience when for example we find our will repugnant to the will of god and it is consequently unquiet we see clearly what is in us of our own and what from god we see what is of our own in the turbid movements against the will of god but what is of god is that strength by which we refuse to consent to them that mental darkness also and that dryness of heart and that affliction of spirit all are our own whilst from god are the gifts that dispel them as the winds carry away the clouds nor does god leave these things in us unjustly because we have deserved for our crimes to have the whole cup of wrath and bitterness poured upon us but we only receive a sprinkled drop when we are permitted to be afflicted if we fly from that drop of bitterness we unjustly fly the justice of god through an immoderate self-love for we have been rescued from great evils and have been reconciled to god through the blood of his son and have to be dealt with in a different way than might have been the case if we had never been aliens from god or had never had a source of corruption in us we must therefore bear the branding of vexation and calamity and feel that the hand of the lord is upon us and that we are stricken from heaven and crucified though less by far than we deserve from this we rise to greater reverence and awe of the majesty of god and so take his visitations in good part knowing them to come from his mercy and love for in short spiritual prosperity is apt to blind the soul as well as temporal prosperity and much much more for there inflation creeps in without observation and injures more secretly and as the soul is more noble by nature than all bodily things she is more easily inflated by spiritual prosperity to forget her nothingness whilst the old self-love and the sense of having been freed from our old iniquities serve the cause of lucifer in fixing us in our own esteem these desolations and miseries break the nerves of self-love and root them from the heart they compel us to cling to god from the very consciousness of having no other strength or relief and all the time they endure they are teaching us what depraved propensities and corruptibilities exist in us this excites one to hatred and contempt of oneself inspires us with disgust and indignation and leads us to reproach persecute and punish that mean and disgraceful disposition that is ever inclined to oppose the generous designs of god and even to take possession of his precious gifts and make them the subject of self-elation for the delight that flows from sweetness of spirit and gives so much satisfaction is apt to foster self-love more even than its own allurements because it may then feed on more precious food and so like mercenary servants we are apt to seek the gifts of god more than god himself so we are left to bitterness and desolation until we gain the habit of loving god for his own sake and not merely for his gifts and until the soul is weaned from her attachments to whatever within her is less than god and the sovereign will of god by this discipline the soul is both purified and fortified and prepared for the grace of perfect charity but this should also be observed that although we ought to prosecute our sins with undying hatred because of their aversion to god and because they are sins yet in so far as they bring us to the knowledge of ourselves make us vile in our own eyes and break down that self-esteem and pride which caused them god draws this good out of their evil as he draws light out of darkness 
on the other hand when we take a selfish delight in our good acts and flatter our nature on their account though they may not alienate us from god they will not join us to god so long then as the vessel of our heart is not well purified from the lees and dregs of self-love it is not good for us to have much increase of illumination consolation or freedom from temptation lest like some low vain person raised to sudden affluence we should become intolerable to our divine benefactor let the proficient rather strive for a calm indifference to all but god himself and leave it to his divine wisdom to give her the gifts he sees best for her condition whether to change her self-love into humility or to perfect her charity for although the soul acts with greater promptitude in the service of god when possessed of inward light and fervour and for this reason these consoling gifts may be desired and magnified yet it is more perfect to be able to love god and do his will without the promptness inspired by them then the will is stronger and more forcible in its virtue when it acts against inward repugnance and with difficulty just as it is easy to go down with the stream but requires much vigour to pull against the stream and by exerting that vigour the powers are strengthened we must therefore clear away from the mind two errors that stand much in the way of conformity to the will and guidance of god the first is to imagine that merit before god consists in facility of will even though that canker of all merit self-love and self-elation should be hidden in that will and even though the more difficult way is comparatively or altogether free from them and therefore produces the real harvest of merit before god for this reason the most loving god who desires what is best for us does not leave his friends in ease and comfort long but excites draws and leads them on to himself through many difficulties in heaven his sons and servants are united with him so intimately that he beatifies them eternally and they repose on him in a torrent of joy but on earth he exacts of them a service and submission perfect indeed and most pleasing to him yet full of trial and perturbation the other error which the proficient must correct and which is often fashioned in the imagination is the desire of seeking a quiet and private life exempt from cares and troubles and from inward discomforts as well desiring this against all the facts of god's providence and against his obvious will for he scarcely leaves his greatest friends without troubles in this life but loves to manifest his power in guiding their vessel through all tempests into the secure port of final rest being great and potent he prepares the souls of his friends for great and arduous works and through their internal conflicts he strengthens the habits of their souls for as saint paul found power is perfected in infirmity 2 corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 and as the rewards of god are not due to those habits but to their acts he gives them much work to do that their reward may be great and ample for what god loves in our love is the generosity which forgets the love of self in his service such was the love of st paul who desired to spend and be spent in the service of his divine master careless what he suffered so that the knowledge and love of god might be increased in himself and in the world to these instructions we must add two more which are of great importance the first is never to anticipate but to follow the leading of the providence of god if we anticipate the order of divine providence we put our own will in place of the will of god this was the severe reproach on the false prophets i sent them not neither have i commanded them 
nor have i spoken to them jeremiah chapter fourteen verse four the reason is yet stronger why we should never run before but only follow the light and grace of god for fidelity to grace is obedience to grace and no sacrifice is pleasing to god which contains our own will our lord did not tell us to go before him but to follow after him and the prophet says it is good to wait with silence for the salvation of god lamentations chapter three verse twenty six nature is excitable impatient hasty and indeliberate the help of god is calm patient and given in due season according as he sees best for us to rush in where god has not invited us or to aim at wonders above ourselves is to yield to the excitable impulsion of nature but to follow the divine leading of grace in humility and obedience is to act within the order of the divine gifts the second instruction of very great importance is this the hour of prayer is the special hour of grace but god gives his grace to the humble the beginning of prayer should therefore be in the profoundest exercise of humility and reverence of which the soul is capable nor should time be spared in obtaining this interior position of humble recollection and sense of our nothingness in the presence of the eternal majesty as well as the entire opening and subjection of our spirit to the divine operations of the spirit of god remember that we live and have our being in god that his light and grace are everywhere present with him and that the only obstacles to their communication are the external obstacle of our corruptible body and the internal obstacle of self-love and pride but we are in god as the bird is in the air and the fish in the water and humility opens our communication with his gifts get your heart as near to god as you can with profound subjection that you may feel his life and not your own nature remember also that gratitude is the final expression and as it were the perfect fruit of humility we will now conclude this volume with a summary of what it contains expressed mostly in the language of a very eminent theologian in no other way can our weak and changeable nature be brought to the unchangeable condition of solid good than by virtue and justice it is by the virtues that rest upon the force of divine grace that we are restored to the form of that divine image which touches upon the unchangeable eternity of god and which gives us a spiritual likeness to god and when that likeness is perfected in our life we keep all temporal and changeable things beneath our feet by the christian virtues we become spiritual and immaterial and put off the corruption of matter from our soul to put on the incorruptibility of spirits the virtues give us stability of mind and will this stability is derived by gift from the eternal stability and by the force of this stability we are neither lifted up in prosperity nor cast down in adversity neither swelled with pride in the one state of our affections nor sunk into despondency in the other but either anticipate the alternation of our thoughts and imaginations and the tempest of the passions or disregard them altogether for the divine virtues lift us into a calm region above these things the fall of man brought us upon a false and treacherous foundation pride took us away from god as our foundation and set us upon no better foundation than ourselves all the miseries of the human race have come of no other cause than the striving to rest upon this false and fictitious foundation and the endeavouring to produce the fruits of happiness from this poor and barren soil what the christian religion has done is to restore us to our true foundation 
and this is effected by the virtue of humility the special gift of christ the virtue of which is to open our eyes to the false foundation on which we have striven in vain to rest our immortal souls and to transfer us by the act of our will to that divine foundation from which all our strength and good is derived but as our false foundation is below and our true foundation is the god above us we can only adhere to his supreme excellence by subjection the lord is my firmament says the psalmist and my refuge psalm seventeen verse three and when we have truly surrendered our trust in ourselves and have justly subjected our nature to god he enters our souls with his charity and we become the loving children of god through the divine force which charity gives the christian virtues we are brought from much division to a state of unity evil is multiform and the vices are many presenting as many faces under as many masks as the number of evil affections that we cherish but the christian virtues by their very nature tend to one and to fix us to that one and that one is the love of god above all things and through that one they unite us with the divine unchangeable and eternal god whosoever has good hold of this one virtue or rather is held by this virtue of charity quits the shadows of things comes to the one true substance and leaves the smoke of the vices to vanish when therefore we begin to cultivate this virtue we begin truly to be and to take the way to unchangeable being for the reason of this virtue is unchangeable its form is everlasting and it partakes of the eternal justice this virtue is a certain adhesion to god and so long as it rests on god it is unchangeable god is the first the infinite the perfect virtue and whosoever receives the light of god and entertains the grace of the virtues hath god for his guest in the home of his soul and his interior is already gifted with the joyful sense of immortal life the pleasures of sense are brief transient and corruptible because they are the good of the corruptible body but virtue is eternal and incorruptible because it is the good of the incorruptible soul among many sublime proofs that god is one and immutable one is founded on the fact that the nearer a soul approaches to god the more she finds that she becomes united in herself and the less exposed to change except in her growth to greater and more unchangeable good but this is only known by the sincere lovers of god the end end of lecture sixteen part three end of the groundwork of the christian virtues by william bernard ullathorne